the previous uh, slide, uh, where you see that the gradient of F is labeled by I because agents that are shown here, they cannot uh, use the whole gradient of F. So they have to just do a, a local update and use the local information of function FI. And so this algorithm, um, which is called incremental gradient method, um, the, the theory for this has been advanced uh, starting you know, in 80s, but it's been, had, it's been an active area of research, research uh, even last year, we had you know a recent paper that showed some uh, speed of convergence for this algorithm in a in a specific setting. So, um, the challenge is you know you know as you can see with a simple uh, change, the the analysis of these types of methods become more uh, complicated. And uh, one of the things I'm going to focus on today is that we are going to uh, see a more complicated constraint set throughout because this is just R n. But in applications that I'm going to discuss, we'll, we'll see more uh, complicated constraints uh, in these settings. So let's start the first uh, part of the presentation, the bi-level uh, distributed optimization. Uh, before I talk about the applications of bi-level distributed optimization, let's just see a couple of uh, classical applications of why distributed optimization is, is important. Um, in image deblurring and image processing in general, it has got different names, image denoising, image in painting, which are branches of you know, image processing. Uh, and so basically, uh, we can consider uh, a problem like this where, uh, and I'm, I'm the, the example I'm giving here is just an image deep blurring example. So let's just say we have a blurred image and we want to make it deep blur. Uh, in distributed optimization, we are interested in solving a problem like this where um, you see that already we are, there are M agents. In this example, there are nine computers. And this AI is a block of a matrix, which is called bl blurring operator. And BI is a piece of this picture, blurred picture given to us. And so what happens here, we uh, split or decompose this picture into nine pieces, give it, give it to these computers. And the computers cooperatively um, minimize this objective function. And eventually, they reach to a consensus, which is the deblurred picture. Uh, so this is basically done in a distributed fashion throughout little communication among the computers. So that's the whole idea in distributed optimization. Another reason distributed optimization has been around, and, and, and it's been around, and uh, it's very uh, it's a trending topic, uh, is because of machine learning. And in machine learning, specifically distributed machine learning, we um, have the training data sets stored in different computers. And so the, this first summation shows that we have M computers or M processors or uh, agents. And this little, this function inside of this sum is the summation of a loss function over the local data SI for, for the computer I. And there are different reasons that we may need a distributed setting. One is privacy of the data, for example, in healthcare, uh, privacy of the patient data is important. And also memory is memory limitation is another issue. And uh, using you know, multiple computers, we can boost the computational power um, of uh, smaller computers. And uh, just to give you some examples for the loss function in machine learning, there are different settings. We, we may have uh, logistic loss regression function, which is given here. Uh, or linear SVM, and there are more advanced versions of these loss functions in deep learning where L is given as a composition of a bunch of functions. So uh, let's say F1, O, F2, O, F3, so on. So there are different layers in neural networks, for example. Uh, but the problem formulation is pretty much this one. So these are the two classical models. Now, let me talk about more advanced versions and why my research considers, you know, a, a bi-level framework because uh, so far we have seen single level. Uh, this is because of the advancement of te technology and one reason, this is just one example. Um, sensors actually can capture now two types of, uh, or record two types of images, HSI image and MSI image. These are hyperspectral images where they um, have a little bit low resolution of the picture as you see in this one. The resolution is not that much, is lower than MSI, but the information about the spectral um, uh, bands, which basically gives information about the material of the objects, is much higher. 
Versus in the MSI picture, which you see a good resolution, the information about the uh, material of the objects is lower. Now, the goal is one goal in this um, remote sensing area is to get these two pictures and uh, do a fusion process and uh, have a, a hyper um, have a picture with higher spatial and higher spectral resolution. So combining these two would be the desirable you know, goal. And so you can imagine two linear inverse type of equations, uh, extension of what I uh, showed in the previous slides. And there are a bunch of operators, B and S and R. These are operators and epsilon here is the noise. Um, YH is the hyperspectral image is this one and YM is this one. And so there has been some work, I'm gonna skip the notation, but there has been recent work that showed that this is a convex optimization formulation uh, of this type. And so you can optimize X and obtain, uh, you know, the uh, fused or sensitized image X by minimizing this function. But the, the practical challenge is that this, um, you know, optimization problem doesn't always lead to a good picture because um, these operators are highly ill posed. Uh, and because of the notion of ill posedness, what happens is you will generate a black picture instead of, you know, uh, uh, the, the object picture. So for that reason, ill posedness had been, has been addressed through a bi-level framework in the literature uh, more recently. And so in the lower level, you see this function, um, which now has been presented as a distributed function. You see that it's, uh, you know, uh, there's a summation here. Um, in the upper level, to, to make the problem well posed, we introduce some regularization functions. It could be L2 regularization uh, or different types, L1 or, uh, or you know, um, Frobenius norm regularization or, or so on. And as you see this problem, which is shown in blue, it has two levels and it is a distributed problem because we have two of these summations. Uh, let's move on to the next application. And this one pretty much, I, I think uh, everyone is uh, familiar with this uh, type of problems, uh, two stages stochastic problems that appear in many applications, including uh, renewable energy and power systems. Um, so these problems, the, uh, it's been known for a while that these problems are challenging, especially because of the uncertainty in the uh, supply and demand sides. Psi uh, denotes the, you know, this scenario I, and it could be, the problem may be very large in, in, in terms of size of the, you know, scenarios. And so for that reason, it's really important to be able to solve these challenging problems in a fast time. Um, for that reason, uh, it's been always an ambition of uh, re optimizers to be able to solve this problem in a distributed fashion. And so recently uh, with my PhD advisors, we have been able to show, show that um, the two stages stochastic problem can be reformulated as a bi-level distributed optimization problem. Again, you see that uh, we have two levels and you have uh, local functions here and basically we uh, we can put a subset of scenarios, the data of that into each computer. And um, the idea, main idea here is that the constraints that you saw in the previous model, uh, the invisibility of those can be seen and formulated as an optimization problem, which is actually the technique that uh, is the focus of my research. We using invisibility as an, another optimization problem. So this is another application for uh, why bi-level optimization, bi-level distributed optimization is important. Now let's just talk about the general framework. I'm going to consider uh, and focus uh, this mathematical framework where we have instead of one level uh, distributed optimization, we have two levels. And there are some assumptions on the convexity and the smoothness of these functions. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just skip those details. Um, and the graph I showed you earlier, which was a ring or cycle graph, is now gonna be more complicated because we are gonna focus on more um, general settings. Why should we consider a ring graph? You know, if graph could be um, a directed graph or undirected, or it could be um, much more complicated than a cycle graph. Um, so we don't wanna limit ourselves to a ring or cycle graph. And for that reason, uh, here I'm just presenting notation. Uh, it's, uh, so I'm not gonna spend time on, uh, you know, in any of these notations, but just for the sake of completeness, I'm just uh, considering 
uh, directed graph. And so agents, um, while the optimization algorithms in each, uh, let's say, pr processor is done, um, they can communicate with each other uh, through this directed graph that I'm showing here. And we denotes the vertices of the graph and E denotes the edges of the graph. And um, neighbors of, uh, you know, um, the parents of uh, node I is shown by N in of um, this I, and this B is induced matrix uh, that is corresponding matrix to a, to a graph. And for the same, I mean, the same notation is for uh, out neighbors or children of node I. Um, but let's talk about, you know, the methodology here, because when we deal with, in optimization, you know, it's been, uh, for more than 50 years, duality theory has been around, and duality theory has been able to uh, succeed in addressing constraint optimization in general. But the, the problem I'm considering here, there, it's a specific constraint optimization problem, and the challenge is that the um, lower level is itself an optimization problem. For that reason, uh, duality theory is not, you know, uh, going to be a direct and a straightforward approach. Um, and so, for, uh, so the, the methodology that I'm um, considering here and proposing is different. is uh, is called iterative regularization. It's basically similar to iterative penalization, where you have uh, the two functions f and g in the, in the two levels of the problem, and you um, multiply a parameter lambda by the function. Uh, in, in this paper, or in this sorry, presentation, the function on the top. And lambda is a small parameter. And so there is some theory on, uh, you know, uh, rate, what regularization is, what iterative regularization is, and what, how it works. Uh, it basically originated by the work of uh, Tekhonov, the math, uh, Russian math mathematician, in 80s. And uh, so some of the uh, techniques uh, used in this research are inspired by contributions of Andrei Tekhonov. Um, and it's actually known from his work that if you solve, or if you minimize this problem um, for different uh, parameter lambda, so you will you will be able to actually converge to the solution of the bi-level problem. Um, so let's just uh, take a look at the algorithm itself and see how it looks like. Uh, the algorithm. This is just an advanced version of what what I showed you in the very first um, introduction slide, where you saw a gradient method. Uh, take a look at this update rules, uh, step number four. Uh, each agent, now we, are, we have label i because we have local copies of the variable x for each agent. Um, each agent is doing some sort of gradient uh, update, uh, but it's basically taking average or uh, calculating an average of what its neighbors think about the, the solution. So that's why you see this rijs, which are... Um, weights that the agent assigns to the uh, information received from the uh, from the neighbors of it. Um, and so these are, you know, uh, R and, and also C that I'm going to talk about, these are parameters that can be set by the optimizer. And uh, gamma is just now a special or customized step size for the agent J at iteration K. But instead of gradient here, we are introducing and considering uh, an approximation of the gradient. And this is actually a new technology, or sorry, new technique uh, that has been around for uh, five to seven years in district optimization, which is called gradient tracking. You want to tra uh, track the gradient information. And so what you see in the next um, update rule is how we update this, how we track the gradient. Uh, by again communicate uh, communication uh, happening among the agents, and so C is another uh, weight that uh, this uh, you know in this setting is assigned to the agents, to the neighbor agents, um, and lambda that I talked about in the previous slide is the regularization parameter because you know it basically controls the uh, importance of the uh, upper objective function. Uh, versus the lower objective function. And you see the difference between uh, this regularized gradient with the previous point. This idea is, is basically called gradient tracking. Now in the literature, uh, if basically if you set this red term to zero, 
it basically recovers what has been recently developed in distributed optimization. It's called the push-pull gradient method. Now, this is actually an iteratively regularized version of that, which is now able to address bi-level problems. So uh, let's just see some of the main results. The main result is uh, as the following. If we do a good job in controlling the step size and also the regularization parameter, if we control the speed of you know, decaying these two sequences, uh, we can actually recover uh, speed of convergence in different senses. Uh, we, can re you know, we can reach to a consensus and we can track what the consensus violation is. Um, we can also, and for both vectors, I mean, we can uh, we can characterize the error of suboptimality, how the top function uh, gets closer and closer to its optimal value, and also for invisibility for the lower level. And so these rates are uh, new, uh, you know, uh, results that we we can get. And and in more specific settings, if we want to solve a constraint problem uh, with distributed optimization, again using the idea of reformulating these constraints as, uh, an, as an optimization problem. You, will, you can reformulate this uh, classical uh, problem to a bi-level formula by introducing this GI, and you will have, again, a bi-level formulation. And so we have immediately these rate results uh, for this a problem like this, over-directed networks. Uh, so these are two main results. And, um, and so there are also results for uh, the settings that we have only this problem over Rn, but the functions are merely convex. Now, in the literature of distributed optimization, this problem for directed graphs, we didn't have convergence rates. And so um, uh, under this assumption that I'm assuming this talk, uh, so using this bi-level formula, bi -level formulation, we can actually recover rate of convergence for even this problem as well. Uh, just to you know, show um, some um, implementation, I'm uh, revisiting the uh, original example I talked about, decomposing this pic uh, you know, a blurred picture into nine blocks, feeding that to different computers, uh, and then, sorry, um, and then trying to de blur this picture. And here is the, the progress of the steep learning, um, you know, among these computers is shown over time. As you see, even though the computers are, you know, having ac local access to uh, just a block of the picture through communication over here, I'm assuming it, again, just to simplify things, a ring graph, but you can just change the setting of the algorithm to uh, a more complicated graph as well. Uh, so the interesting and, uh, you know, important message here is that, uh, through communication, even though the computers do not have access to, to the other blocks of the picture, they can recover the uh, debler picture. And you see that at the end, they are converging to the same picture, which is called consensus. Now, let's just uh, take a look at this video uh, to see uh, the, this process. Um, As you see, it's a little bit slow, but uh, what happens is that we, um, you know, we can see that each throughout communication, uh, each picture is getting more debellared and and closer to uh, the final picture, and and this is exactly the consensus that is going on among the agents. Um, all right, so let's. Sorry, I, let me just check if you, you can all hear me. Um, I feel like my I don't hear my voice in the headphone that I have. So can your voice is kind of uh, it just just the last part of your voice when okay. you were commenting on the video was kind of uh, jumping on and off. Thank you for letting me know. So uh, I disconnected my my headphones. So I, I is this no, it's good clear. now? Yeah, okay. No, it's clear. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to because we um, yeah I'm getting closer to that 25 minutes. So um, this is a second application. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the support vector machines uh, in the literature of you know um, classific binary classification of machine learning. But what I'm showing here is a distributed version of that where there are 10 computers, uh, the data, the training data is stored among them. And so 
we are doing binary classification the, the, between red and blue dots. Um, and the good thing, the good news is that using the uh, proposed algorithm over a directed graph, uh, the, there is not much difference between a centralized supercomputer versus, uh, you know, distribute. So the blue and, sorry, the, the black uh, plot, which is aligned with the other two for different topologies, start on line graph, uh, shows that, you know, uh, doing uh, the decentralized approach is not too much costly. Uh, so it's pretty much close to the centralized schemes. Yeah, so with that, I'm just going to briefly conclude this part of the talk. Um, we considered a bi-level optimization framework uh, over directed networks uh, and uh, we developed a, an iteratively regularized um, gradient method or, or gradient tracking algorithm. And we have obtained new convergence rate statements for different uh, you know, uh, error metrics. Uh, consensus, suboptimality, and infeasibility. And uh, we saw uh, two uh, toy examples, uh, I should call them, distributed linear inverse problems and support vector machines. And this is a paper that has been recently accepted in uh, 2021 uh, American Control Conference. Uh, but there are a lot to explore in the next steps. Uh, what about time varying graphs? What about what if communication changes over time? For example, self-driver cars, the uh, communication among the cars may change in the traffic, and you don't know which car is going to co communicate with, with which one. Um, in a stochastic settings, when fi is a stochastic function or a non-convex function like deep learning, um, and or what if uh, in a more practical uh, you know setting uh, we have uh, asynchronous communication among the agents, which is you know uh, ideally what we want to have. Uh, so that's pretty much the conclusion of the first part of the talk. Uh, with that, I'm going I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about this part. So if the, if there are no more, more I mean if, if there are no questions, I can um, postpone the questions to the end of the talk. But I'd be happy to answer them as well. Thank you, Doctor Yusuf. For a, okay, go there, on. Art. There is a question uh, um, from Doctor Bai. Hello. Uh, very interesting talk for the first half. Um, I I have a quick question. Um, so the nature that in your in your lower level, uh, the agents they are cooperative, right? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, how do you see this compared to um, something called the mathematical programming with equilibrium constraints? Because ultimately your lower level optimization problem can also be represented by the equilibrium constraints or the variational inequality that you mentioned. Uh, so can you uh, address, I mean, what is the difference between your proposed the cooperative uh, lower level versus the equilibrium constraints? Thank you. That's an excellent question. And it's actually uh, exactly what I've been trying to address uh, in the second part of the talk. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned uh, correctly, the uh, there are two types of multi-agent systems. So basically, we may have uh, agents who are cooperating cooperate over a network. Uh, for example, in you know uh, deep learning, the computers are trying to cooperate to deep learning image. But in in other types of other applications, we may have competition among agents, which would lead to a non-cooperative uh, setting. And uh, so that's actually so the uh, that's a great point in the uh, you know acknowledgement slide in the beginning where I introduced the project I mentioned that we consider a solution of variation inequality um, and variation inequality usually refers to equilibriums or equilibria and uh, that is actually the subject of the next part of the talk so I'm going to assume that there there is no cooperation in the lower level um, and but. The interesting thing is that variational inequality can also capture 
the uh, cooperative version as well. The only uh, the only so the mathematical so mathematically speaking, uh, both of these two parts of the talk can be represented by a VI. But uh, but the difference is that the first part is not a game, it's not a, a Nash game or equilibrium. The second part, which I'm going to talk about, is going to be a uh, you know non-cooperative Nash game. Thank you. Then I'll I'll continue to listen to your second part. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess there are no more questions uh, at this moment, so uh, we can go to the second half. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, the second part, as um, mentioned, is a challenging setting where there is a competition, no cooperation among the agents in the lower level. Uh, as the formulation I'm going to consider here is pretty simple, uh, you know, in terms of notation. Uh, the canonical optimization problem that have been around for many years is of this type. So we have a minimization of objective function over a constraint set. Uh, but uh, I mean, usually this set represents either a simple, sorry, uh, yeah, simple set uh, like a box constraint set or nonlinear constraints. You may have a bunch of nonlinear functions here. Uh, but what if we have equilibrium uh, type of constraints? What if we have, uh, you know, cones or different types of uh, constraints? Uh, or what if we have um, a Nash game or a non-cooperative, you know, game? going on in the constraint set where we, what we are interested in finding the best equilibrium among them. Uh, so for that, with that motivation, uh, my focus is going to be solving this problem. And the multi-agent aspect of this uh, part goes back and distributed part goes back to, uh, you know, this solution of a variational inequality uh, that is characterized by this set X and F. Now, uh, solution, so let me, let me first introduce what this means. A uh, solution of a variation in quality, or uh, VI, is a set where we um, find a vector X in this set X, such that this inequality is satisfied for all Y in this X. Now, if you, uh, you know, to get a good sense about what this is, if you have a gradient map of a function here, this represents the optimality condition of um, you know, minimizing that function. So it's basically a generalization. So VI is a generalization of solving an optimization problem. But uh, you know, VIs are not just for formulation of optimization problems. They have been used uh, in for different reasons in the past six to seven decades, uh, starting in the 1950s. Uh, so I have another slide to talk about why you know I consider variation in quality because they're I mean, immensely power, powerful mathematical tools that you can use in very you know, a variety of settings, including uh, non-cooperative uh, games. But let's just uh, take a look at this observation because if you um, instead of function uh, sorry the mapping uh, capital F, if you substitute this point with a zero. Uh, this problem would be equivalent to this. So throughout my talk, if you assume that f is zero, then you, you are basically solving this problem. So it's a more general setting than this, and it's uh, you can capture more complex problems uh, when you consider a vi constraint in the inequality uh, in the constraints. Now, why vi's? Vi's have been used, as I mentioned, the past uh, decades, and um, there are different reasons, for example, complementarity problems, uh, systems of uh, equations, uh, the capital F of X is equal to zero as a mapping, uh, so a bunch of you know, equations. Um, so in all of these three cases um, can be reformulated as a VI. So basically, whenever we have any of these three, we can, uh, you know, the problem that I showed here can capture that. In the constraint level, but more importantly, non-cooperative Nash games also uh, can be characterized as VI, and this has been known for many years. Uh, so, if you have a Nash game where there are multiple players, each player is trying to minimize uh, its own function GI, and there are uh, different uh, agents. Uh, they make decisions uh, XI, each one of them, and X dash I represents the decision of the other players. And the challenge in a game 
rather than an optimization problem is that this optimization problem is parametric in terms of the decision of the other variables, which, uh, other players, which is unknown. And that makes it a Nash game. Uh, so the good news is that the Nash game and the equilibria of the Nash game can be compactly represented by a variation on inequality where X is the Cartesian product of the constraints of the players and the uh, mapping F that I mentioned, the VI, the previous slide, is defined as the uh, you know, gradients of these agents stacked in a vector together. So if you take the gradient of each of these agents, the functions, and put them together, you're going to have a mapping F, and then that basically constructs a VI. So with that, uh, with the formulation I'm considering here, we are going to be able to um, solve a problem of this form when we have an, a non-cooperative uh, game. We can, uh, for example, in the objective function, we can assume that we uh, have summation of uh, the objective function gi of player i. And in the constraints, then we have uh, the solution set of the variation in quality. This is the set x I mentioned. This is the mapping f in, in a more detailed uh, you know, presentation. And so this basically captures the uh, set of equilibria. Now, the question is, which equilibrium among those equilibria is going to be the best? And the reason that this matters is because uh, it goes back to the notion of efficiency estimation in, equi uh, in networks. So uh, in, in the non-cooperative networks, like for example, traffic networks, uh, the designer of the, uh, uh, the network um, would be interested in saying that uh, what's the cost of this non-cooperative behavior from the players? And so how can we design a network uh, that even though uh, people are not going to be cooperating over that, uh, among the different options for reaching to an equilibrium, what equilibrium would be the best? So basically within our, you know, a set of limited options of equilibria, we are trying, or the designer of the uh, network is going to be interested in finding out which one is the best with respect to a cooperative metric. Uh, so that's why we we consider a summation here because we are we are trying to uh, minimize the non-cooperative uh, you know behavior uh, the impact of that in the network. So that's why a, a problem like this is is uh, you know uh, formulated and this problem is called best Nash equilibrium problem uh, in this setting. And the challenge in solving sorry the challenge in solving these problems is that the uh, existing methodology is not much efficient. So what is the current existing method for solving this or finding the best Nash equilibrium? Um, basically is a two loop scheme, is a two loop uh, framework where you just run an algorithm and inside of uh, you know, this for loop, you need to solve a variation in quality. Well, solving variation in quality by itself is not much challenging uh, in a small case. But imagine if you have to solve variation in quality uh, again and again throughout this. And so you're going to have um, a non, sorry, um, uh, an inefficient scheme. And the one reason is that you see that eta t, which is the uh, called regularization parameter, uh, needs to decay to zero every time. So every time that this becomes smaller, this vi variation quality becomes harder to solve. Uh, at each iteration. So you are dealing with a series of, you know, harder and harder problems um, in the inner loop to be solved, which makes this method, you know, not appealing to uh, in, from practical aspects. And the other reason, of course, is that the iteration complexity and the speed of this uh, algorithm is not known. Um, for uh, With this motivation, uh, you know, we have been uh, trying to develop a method that addresses both of these. We're uh, so uh, the goal is to uh, develop a method that is one loop or single time scale. Uh, and we also can characterize the speed of it using, um, you know, um, convergence analysis theory of variation in quality. Now, here's the, how the method looks like. So I'm going to skip the, uh, some of the notation, but the main idea here is that, um, you know, the previous part of the talk, the, the word distributed was referring to a bunch of uh, summation of a bunch of functions. Here, the focus is a block of variables. So agent I or player of the game uh, at each iteration updates um, 
you know, a random, first of all, I should say a randomly chosen player of the game, um, you know, uh, updates the, uh, a grade, basically does a gradient update. And this should be similar to, you know, the very first uh, grading method that I showed you. Um, but the difference is that now you see that the mapping of the VI, this is a block of that. So IK means a randomly selected block um, of the mapping F. And uh, this is a subgradient because I'm, in this setting, I'm assuming that the uh, objective function is not as smooth. This denotes this, uh, um, the IK block of the subgradient of uh, function F. Now, under this setting, the, my assumption is that the function F is known to all the agents versus the mapping F, which, you know, in a Nash game, it represents uh, the gradient mapping of all the players, uh, is locally known as it makes sense. Because, uh, you know, I'm assuming that that function GI, the gradient of that is only locally available to agent I. Now, what happens is uh, we are assuming that we have a center uh, that has, uh, that stores the value of um, the vector XK, uh, basically decision variable of all the agents at time k. And at time k, um, a random node is selected and does a gradient update like this, which uses the idea of iterative regularization to deal with the bi-level uh, structure of, of the problem. And so, um, and that continues. And this, this part is just, uh, we are doing this, you know, average of these xk. So x bar k is just the average of all the generated uh, sequence xk throughout. Uh, so with that, let's just take a look at uh, the theoretical results. Unlike the um, method that I showed you, the uh, existing approach, which was called uh, sequential regularization, regularization, here we are, um, we, are we have um, speed of convergence. And by that, I mean uh, in, in, both, uh, in terms of both objective function f and also the vi. Now for the objective function f, because I'm choosing the, the agents or blocks um, within the um, algorithm randomly, uh, take a look at this IK here. Because of that randomness, uh, we are going to have expectation here. So expectation of the objective function at the average sequence at iteration n uh, minus the best value of the um, f uh, is bounded by some constants. Uh, but the important thing is that the speed is basically one over square, sorry, uh, n raised to one by four. Um, and, and the same thing can be applied and get, I'm sorry, obtained for um, VI part. But for VIs, one of the challenges with VIs is that duality theory cannot be directly applied to characterize rate of convergence when you have, you know, VI constraints. If you had, if you had nonlinear constraints, very uh, duality would be uh, basically the uh, standard approach. But when we deal with VIs, the difficulty is that um, we don't have a dual function necessarily. So this has been addressed in the literature by defining metrics called gap functions. Uh, and interestingly, in this algorithm that we have developed, we can characterize the error of the, uh, you know, the error in the VI setting or the constraint level uh, using this gap function, which was, uh, you know, a, a good um, uh, contribution in, in finding the complexity of the constraint level. And so with that, we have both, you know, speeds equal to each other. Um, this all goes, sorry, this all goes back to carefully choosing the speed of uh, the step size, the diminishing step size sequence, and also the regularization parameter uh, that we have uh, selected. If we, if we change this speed, the rate of convergence would be different. And, and the parameters that you see here, uh, you know, some of them are just constants that, for example, M is the bound on the set X, uh, CF and CF are bounds on the uh, two, you know, function F and, fun and mapping F, and eta naught and gamma naught are the initial step size. This one is the initial step size. This is the initial regularization parameter that is uh, user specific. All right, so one application I'm going to just discuss briefly in a few more uh, more minutes is the uh, a specific Nash game called Nash Corno game. Now, why I'm interested in Nash Corno game? Because Nash Corno games are very popular, uh, you know, models that have been applied in uh, 
communication networks, and also power systems. Uh, so there are, uh, and basically here's the uh, summary of uh, what a Nash Corner game is. It's basically a Nash game where uh, a number of players or firms, they compete to sell a commodity over a network. And I'm assuming they're J nodes. So that objective function of a player that I mentioned in the, my previous, uh, you know, in the previous slides, here is now a, a total cost function, which you can think of it as a negative of revenue uh, or sorry, profit function, right? Uh, this part is the cost, uh, the total cost over the J uh, nodes uh, that the competition is being done. And this is the cost function CIJ that is a function of uh, YIJ. And YIJ is the generation or production of firm I at node J. And the revenue of this, uh, you know, uh, player I or firm I is summation of the revenue over each node, and each node uh, SIJ is the sales of uh, firm I over at node J, and PJ is the price function. And price function is not a constant function; is de it depends on the sales at that node. So that's why you see S bar J here. So um, S bar J is the aggregate say, uh, sales. Uh, in node J. Uh, depending on what that is, uh, we have uh, a price function like this. So the more sales is done in, in a location, uh, we have less price, right? So yeah, I think that the, the price would be less. Um, so that's, and sigma by the way, sigma is a nonlinear, sorry, sigma is a constant greater or equal to one, which makes this uh, function nonlinear. So even though uh, in this model, we are assuming that CIH is a linear function, the nonlinearity comes from this part. We have different challenges here. We have we have a Nash game. We have uh, nonlinearity in the objective function of the player, and we have some randomness involved from the algorithm itself. Uh, so the goal here is to find the best Nash equilibrium, uh, Nash equilibrium in in this competition. And uh, here is the numerical results. The SR represents the existing method that I mentioned. It's uh, criticized because of its, its low speed of convergence and there, there's a lack of you know, um, complexity analysis for that. So you see how slow this is converging. Um, and this one is the um, gap function, the gap function they showed uh, in, in terms of the showing the infeasibility. Uh, and as you see, it's going to zero much faster for these three different settings uh, that is characterized by parameter r and parameter r is again in the algorithm that uh, i showed r is a parameter less than one you can pick it to be any any number less than one and one is the extreme case so no matter what r is you can see that the progress is much faster reaching to the uh, you know equilibrium is much faster and also in terms of the objective function we are also making progress uh, and of course, objective function, even though we have a minimization problem, it's increasing because we have uh, we are we have the infeasibility involved. So not all the you know the sequence that we are um, generating throughout the algorithm is going to be a feasible sequence. That's why uh, sorry, uh, the um, we don't expect the objective function to be necessarily decreasing uh, when we run the algorithm. But the the uh, the good point here is that the uh, stability or reaching to the equilibrium, which is here is the best equilibrium, is much faster than the um, sequential regularization approach in the literature. So to conclude this uh, second part, uh, we considered optimization problems with variation and quality constraints. Um, one main motivation was uh, estimation of the efficiency of you know, Nash equilibria. Uh, and the sequential regularization approach in the literature, the speed of that is unknown. So the good news is that we are, um, you know, we have now an algorithm, single time scale, one loop uh, that we can get non-asymptotic convergence rates for both soft multi and infeasibility. And this is a work uh, that is under first revision by my uh, PhD at YZ. Um, and there are some interesting, uh, you know, future directions. Uh, throughout the second part, I assume that the information of the function f on the top, the, the uh, objective function of the problem, is uh, available to all the players. Um, but uh, what if that is not available uh, globally? What if we have a stochastic version of this algorithm? Um, and what if we have a non-convex setting? 
so with that, I'm going to uh, stop and answer uh, more questions. Okay, we have a question from uh, Dr. Bai. Dr. Bai, please, um, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. The second half is uh, it's really fascinating. Um, I have a one quick question that's really is the start of your uh, second session. So you mentioned that uh, you want to choose the best Nash equilibrium, right? So we are we assuming that uh, in the lower level problem you uh, you have nine unique solution, or are you in the upper level you have some uh, variables that you want to really decide on the optimum value for that variable that would uh, be passed on to your lower level gain? Uh, which one is the case? Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um for raising that question. So uh, the answer is that under the assumptions that we have in this, uh, uh, you know, a part of the talk, uh, we actually may have a lot of uh, inequality, sorry, uh, equilibrium. So okay. the solution of variation inequality. Here I'm assuming that F is monotone and X is a convex set. And usually when that uh, is assumed, uh, then we have, theoretically, we may have more than one equilibrium. Correct. Practically, there could be a lot of equilibria that are within a very close range of each other. So, in in the sense that, uh, the basically think of a real, real application. For example, in a in a Nash corner setting, if we talk about cost functions of players, if players uh, are thinking of millions of dollars or you know earning over a network uh, with a difference of few dollars, we may have uh, a lot of number of uh, equilibria. So. Uh, both practically and theoretically, may have we may deal with a lot of, uh, you know, equilibria and and from a theoretical standpoint, if I had assumed that is this F is a strongly monotone, you are totally right. This would be a unique solution. There is no point in doing the optimization anymore. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. I want to chime in real quick here. Farzad, good seeing you again. Uh, thank you for attend uh, for for participating in this um, informs chapter as our speaker. Uh, I have to run to a 4 p.m. So I thought I'll just say thanks again. Uh, um, uh, this is this is very fascinating work. Uh, congratulations on your career award. Uh, looking um, looking for some bigger uh, things from you in the coming years. Uh, stay in touch, and um, I'm going to let let you all discuss. Uh, uh, um, any questions you may have about um, Farzad. Farzad, if you have anything else that uh, you would like to discuss with me offline, please do reach out. But thank you again. Thank you so okay. much. For Take care. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions from our audience? I don't have any question, but well, you know. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Please, yeah, I just want to say please, this please is. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say this is a really fabulous work. Um, Fazad, I worked before uh, with a uh, mathematical program with equilibrium constraint. That's why I have a little bit background, but this iterative regularization is, is something that's new. Uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, congratulations on the good work. Thank you so much. Um, and and by the way, I have been actually uh, interested recently in doing uh, extending this to a, a, a MPEG, you know, setting. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd be happy to uh, collaborate with you in in future. Uh, so and, uh, talk sure, about sure. Yeah. Yes. The previous uh, the previous uh, work was we were considering the traffic equilibrium in the lower level. And then the upper level was actually to setting up some different uh, congestion pricing schemes that became 
that would become the parameters that you can play with. So really, we do have a strong convexity, uh, convexity con, uh, assumption in the lower level, but it's because of that uh, upper level parameter being passed on to the lower level. That's where the alternatives comes into play. Uh, but uh, this new methodology, solution methodology, is certainly uh, fabulous. So yeah, I would I would have to go back and you know read your papers and see uh, you know whether there's Cer certain uh, collaboration that we can do offline. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I really yes. appreciate it. We, we have a question from Zabi. Zabi, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, thank you so much for a good presentation, Dr. Isakian. I have a question about one of your slides. Can you hear me? Do you have my voice? Yes. Oh, uh, so it was about one of your slides. I think it's slide 11 or, or around that uh, slide. Uh, you were talking about the stochastic pro oh, next slide, I guess. the stochastic programming that you had uh, to level. If you go to the next slide, as right? well. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, ne next this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The previous. One. This one. Yeah, this one. Yes, here. So you were talking about this constraint, uh, or mean uh, that you were talking about uh, the feasibility uh, that you are trying to optimize the feasibility in your constraint. Yes. So uh, here, uh, what you are doing, to, because I'm doing something similar to this thing. So you are talking about the feasibility in this constraint. Do you mean that you are trying to uh, have feasibility for all your realization of the stochastic parameters, and then you get the results and feed it to the, uh, the upper level model, right? Exactly right. So uh, we are basically formulating this as an exhaustive uh, model where all the uh, scenarios are uh, within the constraint level of this. Basically, uh, I'm uh, merging the two stages together uh, and, and turn it into an, an, a single optimization problem. But of course, there's a uh, all of constraints. Uh, but the good news is that this can be reformulated with the idea of uh, Reformulating of uh, you know infeasibility to an optimization problem uh, to the setting, and, and so if if this is done for a simple optimization problem, uh, optimizer might cr criticize this approach because viewing infeasibility as an optimization problem uh, is may not lead to a fast convergence. But when you deal with stochasticity and a lot of scenarios, definitely there should be some advantage when you. Uh, do this over different uh, computers. So that's exactly the the point of this reformulation because th this was not considered. I haven't seen this reformulation in uh, two stages stochastic programming. Um, usually, researchers have been trying to, to utilize the structure of the first and second stage, uh, but but this allows us to be able to do distributed optimization over a network like a bunch of computers, um, and so that yeah. I have a question here. When you are doing the exhaustive search for the uh, for that uh, lower level, uh, so do you reduce the number of uh, combinations, or you try to solve it with distributed computers? No. Uh, basically, as long as the scenarios are not going to cause any feasibility to that problem, they are going to uh -huh. be. So we are just going to have an extended, uh, basically a, a single optimization problem with many many scenarios. Um, in the so you don't have explosion. You don't have explosion in your model, right? Right. Yeah. So, but but all the scenarios are going to be there. Um, oh, uh, the, the the transition from this model. Let me actually show you this this model to this one. Sorry. Uh, yeah. This model to this one. Uh, we have shown this uh, in a recent work, and I'll be happy to send you you know that paper to see how that's done. Uh, yeah, and, and also discuss these more uh, offline with you if you have any questions. Great. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we're at uh, 402. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we benefited from your presentation. Um, again, it was an honor to have you here today. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the day, you all. Bye. Thank you so much, Arsalan. Uh, see you later. Take care. See you. <laughs> Bye.